Hey, and welcome to today's episode of Piano TV. I just wanted to hop on quickly and do a little bit of a Q&A session with you. Just one question that I wanted to deep dive and just, you know, hang out here and have a little chat because I think this is a problem area for a lot of people. I had a question in the uh, group forum from the, the online classes that I teach regarding playing hands together and the, struggling to play hands together. So the question that Timothy shared is that he can play hands separately fine, but really struggle with putting hands together. Are there any exercises or suggestions to help with this? I'm chunking the practice into small pieces. I'm spending 10 minutes on small sections. I'm playing both hands together early on, so I'm not overdoing the you know, the hands separate work, um, but hands together is still my biggest obstacle. I'm putting in the time, but struggling to progress. So any advice on strategies to help with hand dexterity or separating my brain into two <laughs> would be much appreciated. So I like, um, I wanted to read this to you in full because it gives a sense of, okay, I'm doing all the things, but it's still not working. So what is going awry in this equation? I have six suggestions that I'm gonna be sharing throughout this video that hopefully at least something will resonate with you both, you know, Timothy who suggested this question in the first place, but for anyone else who struggles with hands together work. So before I get into the main points, I just want to mention that I do teach kind of like online course hybrid, uh, like live teaching hybrid with pre-recorded courses. I call it complete piano path. And a couple of those classes are open right now. They don't open very often. So if you are interested in hopping on the forum, participating in live feedback sessions and having a step-by-step -step progression through course materials with all the, basically all the materials you'd need like checklists and lesson plans and all that stuff. Do check that out. I'll have that linked below. The class, the classes for um, Complete Piano Path A and B, which are basically for beginners are open until April 19th. And then they're gonna close again until um, basically in the fall. So just wanted to let you guys know in case you were not in the loop with that, which is uh, totally fine, but let's move forward. Six things that will help you um, or help diagnose any issues you're having with playing hands together. So we'll talk about each one in turn, but I just wanna outline them right now. Number one, um, sight reading issues. So this usually is caused by I know, I know it seems like a little bit of a disconnect. I, I shouldn't talk about this too much on the front end. The idea that you struggle to play hands together, that seems very obviously like a coordination issue. But actually sometimes I think it's a comprehension issue where you're trying to tackle pieces or you're reading music that's, that's pretty hard for you. Um, and you haven't yet built the reading skills to go along with um, what your hands are trying to do. So anyways, number one, sight reading. We'll talk about that. Over-practicing the hand separate stuff, which Timothy specifically mentioned like He's not doing that, but some, sometimes people do that. So I wanted to talk about it. Looking back and forth between music and the hands. So getting that like a little bit of the whiplash, we'll talk about uh, that and how to approach that. The idea of drifting, which I think is quite useful. Um, number five, it could be a coordination issue, but in my experience, this is the least likely answer. Um, even though it seems like that would be what the main problem is and it's just a matter of, like doing, like grinding out some practice of drilling the right and left hands together to get them harmoniously working in unison. It's not usually because of that. I would say that's like a, like a last, last option. I, I take a look at all the other ones first. And then finally build bridges and I'll elaborate on what that means. Let's get started. The biggest thing that I find inhibits people's ability to play hands together is issues with sight reading. If there's a significant lag between what you see on the page and the translation process to getting it out and into your hands and into the music, this is going to cause coordination issues. Again, it, it's not as intuitive to think that way, but this does usually seem to be the main issue is people are just overreaching what they're attempting to be able to do. If you scale back, the way that I would diagnose this is something that maybe drives people a little bit crazy sometimes, but I've seen a lot of success with doing this. Find the easiest music you happen to have lying around your home. A lot of people tend to have like a bunch of random books, like beginner books or kids books, if your kids take lessons or anything like that, find the easiest music that you can possibly get your hands on the like very beginning lessons where you're just starting with like two or three notes, hands separate. Maybe it's not until half the book that you start getting into hands together stuff. That's great. Start with that and teach yourself to read that music and uh, do sight reading practice with that music for five or 10 minutes every day. Cause you want to, 
build your knowledge of sight reading from the foundations. So if you feel like there are any issues with your sight reading where you feel like it's a lot harder for you to read what's on the page than it is for you to like eventually, um, you know, maybe play something by ear. If you feel like you have to sit down and really struggle with a piece of music to start to make sense of it, there's probably some kind of sight reading deficiency that's worth correcting just by scaling down to the easiest possible music you can find. 10 minutes a day, five minutes a day, whatever it happens to be. Um, incrementally, it's it's important to do little bits every day as opposed to a big portion all at once. I find that that's really how one builds their ability to quickly and more intuitively sight read. Because once you start closing the gap between um, what you see on the page and what's happening in your hands, your hands will just naturally start to work with you a little bit more consistently. And I also find the step-by-step -step process of really easy beginner books and stuff like that, even if they're meant for kids, is great for hands together practice anyway, because it incrementally introduces you to the idea of hands together playing. So you're doing a lot of simple stuff, like a lot of whole notes in the left hand while your right hand does stuff. So you're starting with some very basic hands together motions that are again, foundational from a technical level, not just from a, a reading level. But this often is like the number one issue that I see. Um, so I really want you to start here. If you're having any issues at all with hands together playing, take a look at your music. How much do you fight with it? How much do you struggle to read it and go from there? So the next one, and I just want to touch on this lightly, but over practicing hand separate stuff. I think one trap people can get into is spending a lot of time with one hand, like just doing a lot of right hand practice, maybe like 10 or 15 minutes working on the right hand, 10 or 15 minutes working on the left hand, and maybe like 10 minutes playing both hands together and approaching piano in this really segregated way. But the reality is, is as a piano player, you're probably not, your goal is probably not to play in this segregated way. It's probably to play in this holistic way, both hands together. That's, I think everyone's goal at the piano. So you wanna make sure that while a little bit of hand separate practice is okay, don't overdo it. So if you're having a 30 minute session and you're in the habit of doing 10 minutes right, 10 minutes left, 10 minutes together, I would really encourage you to do something more like two minutes right, two to five at most, two to five minutes at most left, and then you know 15 to 25 minutes of both hands together. You really are gonna resist this if you like playing hand separate because playing hand separate is a lot easier. You can isolate things and that's really useful and it's productive and you get this feeling of like, ah, I'm getting it. And then putting both hands together can feel like a fight or a struggle and your hands don't seem to want to cooperate with each other. And that has this, uh, it's less satisfying to fight or struggle with something a little bit more in the beginning. So I think people like to resist hands together playing just because it's hard and that's perfectly logical. I resist doing things that are difficult all the time too. It's like human nature. We're a little bit, uh, we like to go towards ease as opposed to challenges, but that's what's going to give you success with hands together playing ultimately is practicing hands together, um, which seems again, obvious, but it's, it's not immediately satisfying to practice hands together because it's harder and it takes a little bit longer for it to come together, but it comes together way faster than if you spend a lot of time hands separate, which I find redundant and not really particularly useful. Okay, so third point, looking back and forth between the hands, like the musical whiplash. I'm not really hardcore about looking at hands. Some piano teachers are. It's like, don't look at your hands. It's the devil. You will invoke the wrath of, um, you know, hellfire. I don't know why I'm going with the biblical thing, maybe because it's Easter. But uh, anyways, there, there can be this reaction towards looking at hands. I, I don't feel that strongly about it. I think that it's fine to look at your hands sometimes tastefully. Um, and if you have music memorized and you're playing more advanced music, you're probably going to be looking at your hands a lot. But as a beginner, it's a really good idea to spend most of your time looking at your music and not doing so much of this back and forth. The only time you really should be looking at your hands is a quick glance when you do a hand position position change. So this is another problem that can be born from tackling music that's too tough too quickly is if you find yourself moving around the keyboard a lot and you haven't yet gotten a good grasp of your keyboard geography and where um, where the keys are and just having a feel for it under your fingers without needing to like look and double check every note, you're gonna run into some problems. So the best way to build that sense of keyboard geography is to start with pieces that um, don't move around too much, maybe once or twice. And then as you progress over a series of months, 
you slowly do these pieces that have a little bit more range um, and sometimes move outside the position. But even beginner level pieces that move outside the range of like a, say like a five finger position where you're gonna you wanna look to make sure you're hitting the right spot, they're not gonna move that much. It's not gonna be like learning Chopin where like every single note is, is a big departure from the previous one. It's gonna be like maybe two or three spots in the whole piece where your hands have to change positions. Those are the moments where you wanna look. And everything else, when you're following the fingering properly, you should be able to sort of feel your way along the keys, especially in pieces where your hands aren't really moving that much or at all. So it's good to get in the habit of just not looking at your hands unless you need to do a little bit of a move, in which case you just do a quick glance. And I like to do it with the eyes and not the whole head, because I do know, like I've seen a lot of piano players look down with their whole head and then what what happens the head motion especially not just the eye motion but the whole head moving seems to um cause difficulty to find where you were in the music and then you get this little like kind of um awkward stilted effect when you, you try to play so this seems to be again it's not related to coordination which you think hands together playing is mostly a coordination thing but it's, it's, again, this is another comprehension issue that I think makes hands together playing a struggle for some people. So I think this is an important one and definitely worth addressing alongside the sight reading issues. So let's talk about the next issue, which is um, drifting. Now, I'm not sure if this is Timothy's term or anything like that, but I liked the term, so I'm gonna co-opt it for the purposes of this video. I think I let myself drift to add in another few measures before I've gotten, say, the new one to two or two to four measures deeply ingrained. So what Timothy's saying is instead of um, just honing in on a really small section, like one measure only and trying to get good at that, or one to two measures only and trying to get, get good at that, especially when you're trying to coordinate the hands, there's, a, there's this tendency to just go a little further. It's not too big of a deal if I go on to measure three or four or five or six, I'll go back and do those first two measures again. But anytime you're introducing new material by you know, just letting yourself drift into the next measure or, you know, it's very tempting to do that because it can be a little bit boring for the mind to just hone in on one or two measures only and like lock into that five minutes. You're not allowed to leave the boundaries of this, uh, these measures and your brain's going to be like, but just a little, it's not too big of a deal. It's like, it's like a little inner rebellion as we're practicing. Um, so try to fight that inner rebellion, try to fight the tendency to drift because what that does is introduce a lot of variables that are just gonna make it harder to remember what you're, you're drilling. If you spend five minutes trying to get the coordination right on something in one or two measures, you should be able to make significant progress in a really short amount of time. But you're not gonna make very good progress if, um, you know, instead of going through it 20 times in a row, you're going through it like basically like eight times in a row because you keep drifting forward to the, the next sections. And, uh, you know, be this is like a mental discipline issue, but, Coordination issues, being able to get both hands working together often is as simple as isolating something into a tiny component. What is the, is it, is it trying to coordinate a broken chord with a, um, like in the left hand with a melody in the right hand? Just do like three notes then. Just isolate literally just three notes and spend five minutes on that and take it in slow motion until you know exactly where each motion fits. Where does beat one happen? Where does beat two happen? What, where are the hands fitting with each other? It's a really like uh, scale it hugely back. I mean, imagine if you were a dancer, it's the exact same kind of thing. If you're doing a particularly complicated maneuver, you're gonna need to slow it down and isolate its components into like tiny motions that will eventually become natural once you've gone through the repetitions enough times. But it's just, you know, doing that in the actual, um, in the first place. So I like setting timers. I like the idea of setting a timer three minutes for just a measure or five minutes for two measures altogether, whatever makes the most sense with the music that you're learning. Um, what my piano teacher used to do with me was 10 times torture, which is a term I throw around sometimes. Can you do this 10 times in a row? And not only that, can you do this 10 times in a row accurately without a mistake? So depends on how competitive you are with yourself. This can actually be a pretty fun thing to do. Uh, keeping track of it, because if you want to do something accurately, you have to be careful. And if you commit to 10 times torture, you're committing to carefulness. Because if you get to time number seven and you slip up, that whole clock resets and you have to go back to try one again. So carefulness, I think when you're learning to develop these techniques and, and basically avoiding sloppiness, avoiding careless errors, is um, this kind of meticulous approach really helps with hands together playing and should not be overlooked. 
Number five, and I think this is the least important of, of all of them, but coordination. It could be a coordination issue, having both of your hands working together. But my advice for this is very similar. If you're having a hard time coordinating the hands, then you can, um, what's probably happening is you're trying to coordinate something that's pretty complicated for you. Maybe it's a technique you've never done before. Um, maybe it's like a few notches above um, what you'd comfortably be able to do otherwise. So I have a couple suggestions for this. One of them is going to be the idea of building bridges, which I'll talk about in the, the sixth and final points. The biggest thing though, is to think about the, the sight reading again, go back to the first point. The music is probably too difficult just to scale it back and give you something measurable. If you're trying to play, let's say a single measure of music, assuming it's a relatively uncomplicated measure. If you're doing a single measure of like, a, you know, 30 second notes and uh, it's, it's like a dense measure, it's like the entire line or something, do a much smaller section. But assuming your one bar section has say like four notes or nothing much beyond that, set a timer for five minutes on just that measure. And if you can't get the coordination in five minutes and you don't make significant progress, even if it's not perfect, um, if you if you feel like you make progress on it or you get it, then it's probably fine. But after five minutes and you're not really making progress, it doesn't get much better. It's probably too difficult for you, um, probably on a sight reading level um, at the very least, in which case it might not be worth doing that particular music or maybe it might be worth doing a little bit of remedial work. Um, other things, uh, doing more hands together practice. So avoiding the temptation to just do one hand at a time, keeping your eyes mostly on the music, um, working in small segments until, um, accuracy is achieved. Coordination issues are solved by all the things I've talked about previously. You can't coordinate complicated gestures if you haven't yet mastered simpler gestures. So just things to keep in mind, but I do want to also add that speed can be a factor with coordination. So often when people have a hard time coordinating the hands, it's because they're trying to go too fast or they're doing something that uh, is is beyond what they're, they're able to do um, fast. <laughs> I feel like I'm just trying to say the same thing a few times in a row. So go slower. I know this is really, it seems like really obvious advice, but probably one of my most and this is true of other piano teachers as well. One of my most repeated comments that I've made over the years is slow down. Just slow it down, just take it easy, go a little slower, start slower, like something along those lines. People have a tendency to want to reach for like the, the absolute peak of what they're able to do in speed, even if their coordination suffers. So whatever you're doing, even if it's gonna be a fast piece, scale it way back, to dial it down, go as slow as you need to, so that the coordination is intuitive. And you might need to play it pretty slow for a while until you start getting that um, sort of sinking in feeling, second nature feeling, depending on if the piece is at your level and of course you're, you're able to accomplish it. One more really quick thing about speed, but I think this is important. Don't expect to be able to speed up a piece in a couple days. Expect, if you're trying to learn a fast piece, allow a slow timeline for that. A little bits of work every day seem to go a lot further for speeding up a piece than doing a lot all at once. So that's another issue. Like people just try to, um, you know, like, well, I've spent three hours on this piece in the last two days, so I should be able to play it fast. There, there seems to be this softening period where things sink into your mind and almost like magic, like in the background over a two to three week period that you can't really bypass very easily. So anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there. But as a final note, the idea of building bridges. So one thing that I've done with my students a lot is teach in a way that uh, simplifies and then builds. So if you're struggling with the music that's in front of you, let's go back to you're trying to play broken chords in the left hand and melodies in the right hand and the hands are not working together. The broken chord is not syncing up per, uh, perfectly. Simplify the left hand then. Instead of doing a broken chord, just do like a single whole note in the left hand while your right hand does what it normally does. And once you get that, make it just a little bit harder. Maybe play the left hand in half notes or something like that. Some kind of bridge between where you're at and what you're capable of doing and where you're going. If you build up your left hand in this case in incremental stages and just simplify, cut some notes out of the equation, you'll add them back in later, but, but scale it back a bit, build the technique of just whole notes first. And then when you're good with that, build it with just half notes first. And then when you're good with that, give it a go with the broken chords. Um, with, I'm just assuming you're doing quarter note broken chords or whatever it has to be. 
Um, it, it can feel blasphemous to some people to modify their music like this, but it's really just a way of deconstructing to simplify. Another way to easily simplify a piece is if your right hand has a lot of extra notes, like um, harmonies or uh, like harmonic intervals or whatever it is, just get rid of some of them. Just do single notes in the right hand and then add those all those extra decorative notes in later once you are able to play the foundational aspects of the piece. Uh, again, Simplifying your music in general might be a, a better solution, but this stage-like, bridge-like approach tends to help some people getting the coordination working for them. So that's everything that I wanted to say. Um, just as a, like, let's just really quickly list through these as a, as a recap. Sight reading issues, biggest problem. Definitely, definitely do some remedial sight work if that's an issue if there's a, a lag time between what you're reading and what you're playing. That's the biggest issue I see with how um, how coordinated people tend to be between the hands. Over practicing hands separate, not spending enough time playing hands together. Looking back and forth between the music and the hands, try to get more comfortable looking just at the music, only glancing down at jumps. The idea of drifting, you know, instead of tightly practicing just a measure or two at a time, you're kind of going forward and doing larger sections, which doesn't help your memory. Uh, and doesn't help your muscle memory in particular. Um, coordination in general, like maybe you are just really weak in your hand in hand coordination. You might need to simplify your music if that's the case. And then finally, one way to simplify music is to build a bridge from uh, like a simpler version of the music to the more complex version that you're aiming towards. So that's my advice for you guys today, just to help with the coordination issue. Cause I find questions like my hands, don't work together, what do I do? Usually has to do with one of these other things as opposed to it being like, you know, you just have a really crappy left hand or whatever it happens to be. That might be a little bit true, but I think there's also all this um, extra stuff that goes into it, which we discussed in today's video. I hope you found this advice useful. Maybe there's some takeaway that you can implement in your very next practice session, something to keep in mind and quick reminder to join my classes. If you wanna get some live feedback, enjoy some camaraderie in your piano practice, which can often be a lonely thing. I mean, it's just, us by ourselves sitting in a dark basement with YouTube tutorials and music books. Sometimes we have a piano teacher, but there's something that's pretty special about being able to learn with a group of other people who are from all walks of life and doing the same things that you're doing, learning the same pieces that you're learning and going through the exact same experience. So I just wanted to make sure you guys knew that was a thing and I'll catch you in the next video. Thank you so much for watching.